Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining uh, NEPC's Market Outlook webinar. Um, happy to have you all here on a, on a hopefully everyone's having a good summer day. A um, couple, couple things we wanted to kind of hit on for today is, you know, provide our market outlook, um, provide some, you know, perspectives of what we've seen this, this last quarter, and then also, you know, provide some forward-looking views on portfolio positioning um, for, um, for investors. Um, first, let me get to kind of introductions. I'm, I'm Philip Nelson, uh, joined by my colleague, um, Jenna Pell, and uh, we'll be walking through kind of those items I, I mentioned. A couple of logistic items to, to, to hit on first. Um, this presentation will be recorded um, and slides will be posted on NEPC's website. You can find that at NEPC Insights. Um, and then also, if you do have questions, we'll take questions at the end and feel free, them, feel free to put them into the, the chat box at the um, top right of, uh, um, of the webinar module. So let's get started and take a quick look at performance for this last quarter. You know, as we look at, um, you know, what we've seen over, over the year, frankly, it's, it's largely dominated by, by U.S. equities, and we'll get into this. It's largely been dominated by, you know, a small subset of um, uh, U.S. stocks, you know, specifically in kind of the, the, the growth category um, of that kind of value growth, growth segment. But as you look across, you know, you can see S&P 5 dominated for the quarter, and you know, other asset classes, you know, especially in the in the rates areas, you know, suffered a little bit as interest rates recovered, you know, off of some of the banking concerns that we saw um, in in March with uh, the collapse of of SBB. And as we as we go to the next slide here and, and take a look at kind of what are some of the dynamics we've seen, you know, we were in a you know what felt like an extended bear market in uh, 2022, and you know over over the last few months, we've we've seen a pretty significant rally, and we've we've come 20% off that off that low, which technically means we're we're in a we're in a kind of more bullish market. And I think there's some question marks of how strong is this is this market? You know, what are, what are some other factors that give us pause and give us concern for you know the forward outlook for especially the mega cap stocks um, for uh, for S and P 500 as well. So as we go to the next slide here. You know, one of the dynamics that we've that we've seen is, you know, looking at, you know, growth versus value dynamics. And and we try not to have kind of a binary view of thinking about growth stocks versus value stocks. You know, at the end of the day, what we want to be holding is is stocks that generate free cash flow, that generate strong earnings, um, that you know you can you can hold at a reasonable, reasonable price and kind of grow over over the long term. But you know, occasionally you get Kind of these dynamics where you know markets move in a, in a kind of uh, you know opposing fashion, and we certainly saw that this 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 last quarter and this year, you know the first two quarters of 2023, um, you know were some of the toughest quarters for for value relative to growth, and really the only comparison you can find is looking back to the late 90s, early 2000s, you know in the in kind of that extreme dot com uh, bubble that that we saw there. So you're seeing a bit of a trend. In terms of you know small number of stocks, you know certain types of growth stocks really led the way, and we'll have some other data points here that show that you know really the rest of the market is is lagging to some degree uh, in terms of uh, performance. And as we look at that, you know here's the performance for SP 500 for the year, and we really can take five companies and show that you know these five companies: Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Nvidia, and Microsoft. You know, generated a significant portion of the total gains for S and P 500, um, and you know, absent the rally we saw from from these five names, it'd be a pretty uh, fairly muted year for for large cap uh, stocks. And you know, as we look at kind of you know smaller cap stocks, you know, haven't have not done as well, obviously, uh, relative to that small cap, that large cap space. And as we as we look at some of these trends, you can see. You know really where it's coming from. Um, you know it's the tech names, it's it's the Nasdaq. Um, you know you know composition that you know we we rarely talk about Nasdaq, but you know in, in the context of this recent performance, I feel like you know it's it's uh, something we have to mention. And when we look at you know Nasdaq performance for the first six months, you can see it's you know stellar return. 
you know, uh, outsized relative to kind of anything we've seen over the last, um, you know, 30 years or so. And again, it's it's the only relative comparison we can really see is some of those those periods in in the late in the late 90s. I think you know another interesting aspect and you know some news that's come up in recent days is this idea of the Nasdaq needing to rebalance itself, which doesn't happen very often. But you know when uh, a certain uh, threshold of large names in Nasdaq you know reach a um, um, an exposure level, the Nasdaq's forced to kind of rebalance their their Nasdaq 100 index, and that's something they'll be doing over they'll be doing over the next month, which you know only happens when you have these extreme levels of of outperformance. You know, I think what that means for the market is somewhat uncertain, but it's just another data point that says we're running at some kind of unusual outliers in terms of uh, of market performance. And you know, sticking to to the Nasdaq, you know, just looking at you know Nasdaq, which is a more uh, large cap, you know, market cap heavy uh, index, and we just compare it to, you know, the smaller cap names in in the U.S. So looking at Russell 2000, and you can really see, you know, these these extreme kind of valuation dynamics. And there's two, you know, two rationales you can you can pull from this. You can say, a, a the uh, valuation level for for Nasdaqs at kind of extreme levels and and outsized, but you also can say there's some underperformance that we're seeing in the small cap space relative to what it should be and what are some of the underlying economic conditions that that we've seen. So it could be a little both of these, but it's again kind of highlighting some of these dynamics that are at more extreme levels that give us pause about you know exposure to kind of mega cap stocks um, in the U.S. And, and uh, another example of that is, is looking at a, it's a fairly crude measure from a valuation signal, um, but just, you know, very simple price to sales. Um, you know, it, it, it's not going to, you know, highlight valuation differences on the margins. It's really a, a measure show when we have real big outliers. And when you look at, you know, the major indices across S&P 5 or uh, non-U.S. equities or Russell 2000, you, know, you can see, you know the price to sales ratios are you know in a you know one time or or lower level, and then we look at the you know the top five companies in the S and P 500. It's a very different profile in terms of you know double digit price to sales level, um, which don't compare to what we saw in the late 90s in terms of kind of extreme valuation levels. But there's very few periods where you see price to sales dynamics at these levels, and it's again it gives us pause, gives us you know a sense of maybe there's some headwinds coming. For these mega cap stocks, um, if they can't deliver outsized earnings growth over the next year or two, I think one of the dynamics at play here is thinking about, you know, inflation in in, in the U.S. and and Jen will get into this a little bit more. Um, I think one thing to to highlight is when we look at you know some of the monthly inflation prints or the Fed's you know preferred measurement, so PCE. Um, you know, you can see that, you know, at, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you know, moving average um, per month, and that implies, you know, somewhere close to a 3% annualized inflation rate, which is still well above what the Fed would prefer in terms of 2% inflation rate. So even with some softening inflation, we're still above where the Fed would like to be. And we're still looking at probably a, you know, tighter monetary backdrop than, than we've seen. And I think as we look at, um, you know, expectations around um, Fed funds. I think it's important to emphasize that, you know, thinking about what will the Fed do in a couple of weeks or what will the Fed do in, in three months is, is I'd say, kind of less of a priority for us. I think what's more important is thinking about what is the market pricing and reacting to where cash levels will be 18 months from now, two years from now. And what you see is some real, dramatic shifts that we've seen from the start of the year to March 13th, which, you know, represents the, the first trading day after SVB collapsed um, to, to yesterday. And, you know, what, can you, what you can see here is we're, we're looking at cash levels that are likely to stay uh, above 4.5% for the market's expectations, you know, at least over the next 12 months. Uh, and you think about kind of where we've come from, whether it's the start of the year or you know, even even last year at this time, um, 
you know, uh, cash levels at four or close to five for an extended period, it would be a very bearish indicator for, for most. But in some cases, it also reflects the above average or sticky inflation levels and the fact that economy and jobs and job growth is still pretty good. So there's there's a there's a fair fair volume of of mixed signals that we're seeing here that that Jen will that Jen will get into. And maybe that that last mixed signal that we we have here for you is just looking at the uh, the yield curve here on the next page. And you know, looking at you know the the yield curve as measured by ten-year Treasury relative to two-year Treasuries, you can see that the curve remains in kind of a, a deep inversion, um, which is the only comparison we really have to this is the late late 70s, early 80s, in a time where we did have kind of elevated inflation, or the Fed was was not able to bring inflation down to to its targets. So we had a you know very prolonged level of of curve inversion. And say, as we look at kind of current dynamics and, you know, as we saw, um, you know, cash expectations, the previous page, something's likely to continue. Historically, inverted yield curve has signaled that a recession is coming. Um, but at the same time, uh, a lot of mixed signals as to when or if that 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 will happen. So with that, you know, turn it over to, to Jen to uh, dig into, you know, thinking about mega caps and, and central bank policy. and. Um, off to you, Jen. Great, thanks, Phil. Um, so as, as Phil just mentioned, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and kind of focus on the economic backdrop and ultimately how that's informing our current outlook and, and some of our portfolio positioning views. So for much of this year, we've highlighted this confusing or, or even kind of conflicting data points that have been coming from different parts of the economy that have really muddied the water in terms of what the path forward will be. And thinking back to earlier this year, there was all this debate around whether we would see a, a hard landing, a soft landing, or no landing outcome, given the inflation backdrop and, and the Fed's actions that kept pulling market pricing and expectations from one potential landing path to another. And then when the banking sector stre stress hit in March, that was somewhat of kind of a, a pivotal moment as we just saw with the change in Fed funds rate expectations because it accelerated a lot of recession concerns and it caused the market to, to flip to pricing in this deeper recession or kind of more of that hard landing outcome with the thought that we know monetary policy has a long and variable lag and that could have been the first shoe to drop and maybe we'd start to see some other areas of the economy breaking as well. But as time has passed, a lot of those concerns have dissipated and they're no longer really weighing on the market. So when we look to the underlying economic data that we have today, as, as Phil walked through many of the, the major data points, we'll see that you know, there are still these confusing signals, but not that much has changed. We still have a lot of these bifurcations in the economy. We have moderating, but still elevated inflation. The labor market slowed, but it's still quite robust. And the goods economy is in a recession, but some of the dynamics in the services sector are still more favorable. So a lot of these confusing data points are still out there, but as we look across the economy as a whole, it seems to be in pretty decent shape, especially considering the change in interest rate environment that we've had. And so this backdrop has really caused those recession expectations that were priced in to kind of pull back. And the best way to see that change in posture is through the market's expectations for interest rates. So a little bit different than the chart we showed before, but as we, we mentioned at the end of last quarter, when all of those recession concerns were heightened, there was a big differential between what the market was expecting, which was more in line with that hard landing line we have here, with um, pricing in more of an aggressive pivot from the Fed that would push rates lower versus where the Fed was coming in and, and they were continuing to message a, a tighter for longer policy bias, given some of the persistence that we've seen in Indian. And that seems to rhyme a little sir, with the soft landing outcome. So as time progressed, both of these have, have converged and we've seen the market moving away from pricing in that hard landing outcome. And um, this is really kind of reflective of like, that we're in a different interest rate environment today and the market's expecting that we're going to be there for at least the foreseeable future. 
And what's interesting, you know, Phil just walked through all of the dynamics that we saw in U.S. markets and how strong performance had been, even if it was isolated to just a few names. But there's certainly a, a little bit of a disconnect between the rally in equities and this tighter policy backdrop by the Fed. We generally expect that the outlook for equities would be a little bit less favorable with some of the headwinds that come with higher cash rates and higher interest rates being priced in. But that momentum component around AI and some of the growth names have outweighed maybe some of the, the fundamental impact that this higher rate, higher inflation environment might have. Um, because companies will have to absorb higher interest costs, higher labor costs, and, and that ultimately will flow through to, to earnings and margins. So all of that is feeding into some of our views around portfolio construction, uh, which I'll get to shortly, but we wanted to take just a closer look at some of the key economic data points. So as I mentioned, the, the, the economic backdrop has stayed fairly consistent. When we look to many of the classic economic indicators, they're still flashing the warning signs of a recession. And this is where a lot of those hard landing concerns remain. In particular, looking at the leading economic index, this has been declining for 14 straight months and we're kind of stuck at these levels that are consistent with a recession or a severe economic contraction. And that's why you have this fairly strong correlation between the LEI and, and the S&P index. But looking under the hood, a lot of the negativity here is being driven by the poor data coming out of the manufacturing sector and the goods economy. And even uh, the yield curve that we talked about, that has an influence here as well. So while this is an important composite indicator, it gets back to some of the bifurcations we're seeing in the economy. All of these rate sensitive sectors have slowed and manufacturing, for example, is, is pretty deeply in contractionary territory. But this is just one piece of the puzzle and kind of the offset to this and some of the data that we're seeing out of the services sector, and especially when services are about two, thir two thirds of our economy, we could continue to see strong spending and, and activity on that front, which is underpinning some of the more resilient growth story that we're seeing. And if we take a closer look at the labor market, like I mentioned, we have some signs of slowing here, but still quite robust numbers for the pace of job growth relative to history. And we still do have some signs of an imbalance between labor supply and demand at play, though maybe not as, as dramatic as it was at, at some point last year. But relating this back to some of those illustrative paths for interest rates a, a couple slides ago, you know, there's more of a no landing signal being sent here with the unemployment rate at 3.6%. And when the labor market's that tight, it, it kind of reinforces some of the potential upside risk to inflation and biases interest rates to the upside. And of course, this is a, a very important data point for the Federal Reserve as well. Um, so if we continue to see this tightness, that's gonna make their job of getting inflation under control just a little bit more difficult. Now looking from an inflation standpoint, as, as Phil mentioned, headline inflation rates have come down pretty meaningfully off of peak levels, much of which has been driven by some of the deflationary pressures we're seeing in energy, food, and goods prices. But the focus for the Fed and is on core or even super core inflation metrics that are tilted towards stickier areas like non-housing services or shelter that have continued to see inflation pressures even as those headline figures have come down. So we have certainly seen some progress here, but core inflation rates are still well above Fed's 2% target. And with that in mind, I, I do think it's important just to mention that we had an updated CPI release yesterday that came in across the board a bit lower than expected. And so that's another encouraging sign here, but we'd caution maybe not to read too much into one data point, but it's important again, to look at the trend in these month over month figures that we're seeing. And we're still seeing many of these core metrics stuck around four or 5%. So there's some more work to be done by the Fed. And one other way to look at the differences that we're seeing in underlying inflation is through sticky versus flexible inflation factors. Again, this just highlights how significant those flexible factors have declined. A lot of these stickier tricks by definition have trended a little bit slower and they appear to have at, at this more elevated 
And when we think about sticky inflation factors, really this kind of comes back to shelter and wages. And shelter is something that we've talked a lot about over the last few years, and I think the lagged effect has been quite well publicized. So figures have been trending lower as many expected with the impact of, of higher in interest rates and mortgage rates on, on the housing market. But that's one area where we're still seeing some pressure today. And if we start to see more resilient data out of the housing market, that could be an upside risk to inflation as well. Um, but really on the services side, you know, I mentioned there's all the strength in the labor market that we're still seeing, and that has an impact on wages. You know, wages are, are really the most important input for many small and service oriented businesses. So if we have that tight labor market and some upward pressure on wages, that's gonna be an impediment to getting inflation back down to 2%. Um, so again, a lot of progress has been made um, in terms of headline inflation coming down, but we are biased a little bit more toward a stickier path for core inflation moving forward, given the dynamics we're seeing, especially related to the labor market that we think can keep some of those metrics elevated. Now, bringing that all together, the economy has probably been more resilient than many would have expected coming into this year. Um, there are pockets of the economy that continue to feel the impact of the tighter rate environment, but the dynamics in the services sector and the labor market are supportive of more of that no landing or soft landing outcome. And with all of that in mind, we still believe that the recession risk for this year is quite low. Um, and with our bias towards stickier inflation than what's being priced in by the market, we don't think it's likely that we're going to see the Fed moving away from their tighter policy bias in the near term because there aren't clear signs that they've successfully managed to crush inflation just yet. So with that backdrop in mind, um, I want to walk through some of our kind of higher level thoughts on portfolio positioning. As you can imagine, with a lot of our comments on the significant outperformance of US large cap this past quarter and acknowledging how the rate environment has changed, we've updated our positioning to reflect broadly a, a bias more toward fixed income relative to equities. So in particular, we are concerned about some of the dynamics that we walked through, especially with the mega cap names in the US. So the high level recommendation here is that investors look to take down any equity overweight relative to strategic policy targets through a reduction to those mega cap names and the S&P 500. We also think that this is a good time just to be thinking about adjusting your equity positions overall, given the dynamics that we've mentioned. So with that S&P reduction, we still think it's important to hold US large cap value positions, but part of this is also looking to tilt some equity exposure out of US large cap to more active spaces, including global equity strategies. That can accomplish first that S&P reduction, but second, it increases the alpha potential in the portfolio as well. And then finally, we are recommending increasing exposure to US high yield, as we think this is an attractive carry opportunity, and that the space will likely offer greater return relative to US large cap. So just a few data points that dive a little bit deeper into some of the views. We talked a lot about the US large cap space today, but we don't view the current dynamics as necessarily being sustainable going forward. The rally has been extremely narrow with just a select number of names accounting for outsized portions of the returns. So this is a much more siloed recovery, which gives us some pause because typically when you have such narrow breath, it's not a bullish sign for the market. So as we think about the path forward for US markets, there are kind of limited paths that the market could go. We could see you know, something similar maybe to, to, to .com where momentum and, and fund flows reverse around the mega cap names as they start to price in the impact of higher rates, higher inflation, and then we'd see valuation profiles adjust. But the other side is that we could see more momentum around AI that drives prices and, and keeps valuations expanding even further. And that's really the, the risk of our current equity positioning. But as we look to the valuation profiles and some of the embedded expectations in the market today, we think that they're reflective of some unhealthy or even frothy dynamics in the market and don't think that that's a sign of a sustainable path going forward. And one metric we often look to is just the S&P earnings yield relative to triple B corporate bond yields, just to get a sense for just 
kind of the relative activeness of equities and day this is showing that there's less value or less opportunities in equities relative credit so this is one piece informing that broad bias toward fixed income equities and even as we see some frothy valuations in the mega cap space it doesn't mean all of the u.s large cap complex is unattractive we do still see an opportunity and a, a pretty healthy earnings yields on u.s large cap value and phil kind of talked about some of the performance dynamics up front but we do still see an opportunity and a, a, um, in in u.s large cap value um, even as performance has struggled this year but we see value in holding value, especially with the backdrop of, of elevated interest rates and, and stickier inflation, that should start to benefit some of the cyclical names in this space. And separately, when we look to the yields being offered on the high yield index at high single digits, that's quite interesting. And looking at the, the broader fixed income complex, with how things have changed this year, we think it's really important for investors to broadly evaluate the risk return benefit of fixed income investments. There aren't many times that you're gonna hear us say that we're comfortable with investors holding cash, but with the, the really sharp step up in rates, we see that cash is now competitive with many other areas of, of high quality fixed income. And obviously it, it provides some liquidity and, and optionality as well. So within the safe haven space, we think maybe holding a bit more cash makes sense. And beyond that, I mentioned kind of the yield being offered by the US high yield space. Um, so we are, are interested in the all in yields being offered there. Even as credit spreads are close to median levels, we see this as an attractive carry trade, especially if we have kind of a, a soft landing or no landing base case, we think that high yield will offer a better risk return profile relative to US large cap equities over the next few years. So with that broad messaging in mind, we do think this is a good time for investors to think about and kind of reassess strategic asset allocation targets, specifically with an eye to, to adding exposure to publicly traded fixed income investments, given how much this backdrop has changed this year. Um, and with all that, I, I'm going to turn it back to Phil for our Q&A session. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um... We've got a couple questions, and you know, why don't we, you know, start the first with with you related to, uh, you know, CPI, and you know, what should we, what should we make of yesterday, yesterday's, you know, CPI print, and how it how it might affect, um, you know, the Fed's path, and and how you know market expects, you know, rates to go uh, uh, going forward. Yeah, sure. So I, as I mentioned, yesterday's CPI print surprised to the downside. Um, we saw headline inflation was now something around 3%, and there were softer readings in almost every category, whether it was core goods, services, shelter. Um, and I, I alluded to this, but kind of the reading that we had last year at this time was quite elevated. So we came into this print knowing that we had a high watermark behind us, and there was going to be some impact from the base effect. And um, I, I think it's fair to say that when we look forward to the next few prints, there are some more difficult inflation comps coming up for the rest of the year. So it's a little hard to read too much into this print knowing that backdrop. And as that relates to kind of what we're going to see from the Fed going forward, I don't really think it changes what we see from the Fed in July. Um, the market's still pricing in another rate hike later this month. Um, and, and I don't think we have anything in the data that suggests that the Fed's going to start pivoting. But I do think it could have an impact on what happens later this year. And I, I think you mentioned it earlier. It's not really what what happens with the next hike or the following hike, but it's how long we stay at these levels. And if we keep seeing core CPI or core PCE stay elevated, we're going to have to stay in this type of, of tighter rate environment for longer than the market's pricing in. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And a uh, second question that, that's come in, um, you know, related to our thoughts on high yield, I've got a couple couple varieties of this, this question, so I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase. Um, but you know, looking at you know high yield spreads, they look you know close to fair value or you know uh, tighter spreads than um, you know typically you would see in an attractive period for for high yields. So what's our what's the rationale for why this is a good opportunity, uh, especially with 
a recession may be on the horizon and how how does high yield fit into this um, and and i can i can take this one and and I, what i would say is you know as we look at you know the opportunity in a high yield first and foremost we're uh, we don't say this often, but you know we're really looking at the carry and the quality of the carry you get for high yield. You know, you can get a eight percentage, um, you know, yield in in the space. And when we look at you look at spreads today, you know, they're close to fair value. Um, so we don't we wouldn't say the there's a you know urgency to move into to high yield, and it's different than some of the previous periods that you know, you've heard from us where we say high yield attractive, where you know, spreads have blown out to 700 basis points or 1,000 basis points, and there's a real tactical shift to move into move into this space. But as we look at high yield today, you know, we think it's incrementally better than you know, you know, some of the exposures in the in the mega cap space. And so, if you have you know an overweight exposure to to S and P 500, we think bringing that down a little bit and allocating that towards high yield, we think makes a lot of sense. And we think over the next three to five years, it's is um, an area you'll be you'll be rewarded with uh, with that exposure. And as we think about you know the potential of a recession and some of the comments you know Jen had, you know when we model out our you know expected default path for for high yield bonds, you know over the next five years we're we're approaching you know something something close to a you know twenty percent cumulative default rate for the next five years, which reflects somewhat of a normal recession. And I think. As we, you know, look at you know potential for the U.S. economy, you know, a a uh, easier or a more shallow recession is maybe more likely than a um, you know than a deep recession, and high yield should benefit in that and offer an even higher um, higher yield in in that space. And so, uh, I very much appreciate the, the the thoughts on on high yield. It's not your typical market environment that you'd want to. You know, make a big shift into high yield, but it's one where you know if you can earn seven, eight percent, and find some higher quality, you know, carry on a relative basis, we think that makes sense despite the despite the market, um, despite the market backdrop. And you know, with with that, I think we'll I think we'll wrap up and um, those are the questions that we've gotten today. I want to thank everybody for for joining us. Um, we'll be back again for our next quarterly update uh, in the second week of of October, um, and uh, look forward to chat chatting with you all then. And just a reminder: this recording and the slides will be available on NAPC's website at NAPC Insights. Um, so feel free to look to those. Um, uh, tomorrow when all this is, is posted. Thank you all and have a great, great day.